Très bien. Thank you, Jerome. Welcome, everybody, this morning. It's great to see all of you here. We actually uh, have run out of seats, so we've had more people show up this morning than we had in the count. So I do know that they brought some additional seating in. So if you don't yet have a seat, just uh, give us a few minutes. We'll find a seat for you and, uh, and have you seated. So uh, thank you very much for your patience on that. Um, I know uh, our speaker is on his way. He did say he would be a few minutes late this morning, but we do have some things that we need to go through before we get to him. Um, we are going to, uh, if you look at your desk or at the table there, uh, there's a couple copies of our annual report. And uh, the annual report is, I know many of you have a copy of that already, but if you don't, uh, please take a copy with you. Uh, it does give a, a complete uh, overview of 2022 and all of the things that we've done at uh, Middle Michigan. Um, just a couple of highlights. I'll mention that, you know, in terms of the company calls that we did and the company assists, in the past few years, we've distributed well over $6 million dollars in uh, COVID relief and small business relief and match on main grants, which for an organization our size is pretty significant. And we're delighted to be one of the 15 organizations that the state continually turns to, to distribute funds uh, on behalf of our, of our local uh, businesses and our local governments. Um, in fact, in, um, in the past few years, in, in, you know, we have a uh, we've been expanding recently, but in the past few years in Region 5, I mean, we were distributing funds not just for Isabella County and Clare County and Gladwin County, but also Midland and Aranac and Gratiot County as well. So uh, we've, we've had to step up and, and be a regional leader, and, uh, and we've been able to, to meet that. Um, talking about expansion, so as you probably know, our organization started in uh, 1981. Isabella County. In 1999, Clare County joined us. And in this past fall, we were delighted to have uh, Osceola County and Gladwin County join our organization as well. And, uh, you know, we're a small team. We do get stretched a little thin sometimes, but we've been able, you know, with all of your help, to be able to uh, meet that need and, and to be a leader uh, for four counties in our region. Okay. Well, one of the things that we want to do this morning, we want to recognize some folks that have been um, demonstrated outstanding work in various areas in, in the four counties. And we have some awards. And Katie Mora, uh, Vice President of Middle Michigan. Uh, in fact, let's have a round of applause for Katie. <laughs> Katie does an incredible job. Um, for our organization and, and we, she works in so many different areas and I could not do this job without her, I will tell you that. Um, the first award that we're gonna give out is the Business Attraction Award to Renesal, a polyurethane processing plant in Bay City, Michigan. And they suffered a major fire to their facility in the summer of 2021. The owners who had roots in Clare evaluated the situation and felt that coming back to Clare County might be best for the company and the employees, and many of them had roots in Clare County. And so uh, we, were, we were delighted this year uh, with the help of many local leaders. We assisted Renesal in securing the last remaining parcel in the Clare North Industrial Park. And by the way, our speaker is here. <laughs> so, um, we're, we're, yeah. And so our business attraction award goes to Renesal Corporation. If they'll stand and... Uh, Katie will give you the award. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Brian and Kelly, come on up. You're at the head table right up here. All right. Okay, our next award is our uh, business expansion award. I don't need any notes for this one, you guys. Back when, um, when I first started in 2015 in this position, uh, Bandit Industries, a safe to say, was at about 350 employees in 2015. Uh, we just uh, celebrated the grand opening of their new facility in Union Township. Uh, they're pushing 800 employees at this point, and I understand have 100 open positions as well. And then this new facility is going to add an additional 200 employees to Bandit Industries. Uh, they're also an employee stock ownership program company, 
and ESOP, and we are so delighted to, for the second year in a row, give them our Business Expansion Award. So Kelly, uh, if you guys would stand up, please, Amanda. Thank you very much. Our next award is uh, our Small Business Award for Cardinal and Clover in Clare County. Uh, Christine Smith has been a longtime member of the downtown Clare community, working in various roles at the Doherty Hotel over 16 years. Shortly after leaving the Doherty to pursue personal pursuits, she suffered a devastating stroke and immediately uh, had very, uh, 30 surgeries and I understand four years of rehabilitation, but she wanted to make a comeback. So renting the only portion available uh, in the last empty building in downtown Clare, Christine and her husband, Joe, who had owned his own construction business for more than 30 years, purchased Kula Cafe in 2018. What they've done here is to try to create a market type atmosphere to support further economic growth in downtown Clare, hence the beginning of Cardinal and Clover collaborative journey. The collaborative now hosts 10 businesses with eight of them new to Clare. We are more than proud of the work that uh, they have done and are happy to give them this well-deserved award. So if you'll stand up, Cardinal and Clover. Yep. Our next award goes to the Beaverton Tavern in Gladwin. After falling on tough times, the mid-Michigan staple known for their huge burritos and top-notch Mexican food was forced to close their doors in 2020. And this, you know, we know happened to many different restaurants as we went through the pandemic. Soon afterwards, it was purchased by Robin Smith, Martin and family. Well, they went to work to resurrect this business, but they wanted to do it the right way. Um, renovating a centuries old building is no easy task. Unexpected challenges of COVID and supply chain added significant stress to an already large undertaking. But with the renovation complete, which included a front facade and interior, entire interior, including a kitchen area, the business reopened their doors to the public in June 2022. For their commitment to restoring and resurrecting an establishment so vital to their community in the face of unprecedented challenges, we are proud to award the Beaverton Tavern uh, the Gladwin County Small Business of the Year Award. If they'll stand up. Okay, thank you. Okay, next, uh, Pleasant City Coffee in Isabella County Small Business Award. After receiving their Match on Main grant in 2021, Pleasant City Coffee has not only expanded its square footage through the addition of outdoor patio seating, but renovated their entire building in order to serve coffee and Michigan wine. A staple in downtown community, uh, business owners Joshua and Rachel Agerty show the commitment that they have to this area every single day. Their business creates a sense of place for those who want to visit and those who want to stay in the area. So our Isabella County Small Business Award goes to Pleasant City Coffee. We'll stand up. Oh, there, okay. Okay. We'll get that award to them. Okay, and then uh, June Berry Cottage would be our Osceola County awardee. June Marie Esser, owner of June Berry Cottage, isn't afraid to think outside of the box. Her quilting store is an anchor tenant in downtown Everett, and you can see uh, June Marie's smiling face on Michigan Main Street Post, highlighting the value she brings to the community. Additionally, June Marie has helped facilitate bus tours in downtown Everett and recently received a Match on Main grant to bring her first line of sewing machines to the area. So with all her hard work, we want to honor uh, uh, June Berry Cottage and, and June Marie, and if she'll stand, there we go. Okay. Two more awards to go. Our Collaborative Partner Award is the Mount Pleasant Area Chamber of Commerce. Although the Mount Pleasant Area Chamber of Commerce has always been a partner to Middle Michigan, under Liz Conway's leadership, a recommitment to economic development and the work we do collectively is worth acknowledging and headlining. Together, the Mount Pleasant Area Chamber of Commerce and the MMDC have facilitated events that support area businesses and foster positive discussions and how we can sustain and grow the community. And I just want to say, 
on a personal note. So this morning when we were starting to get a lot of people here at all at once, Liz said, can you use my help? And I said, sure. And she manned our table along with my staff. So Liz, you know, you've done such a fantastic job. And we're very proud to give you this Collaborative Partner Award. You'll stand up, you guys. <laughs> Last but not least is our Mike Finney Innovation Award. Um, and this goes to Tammy and Tricia uh, Galloway. Uh, Mike Finney, um, for those of you who know who he was, uh, one of the most innovative economic development leaders that our state and even our nation has ever seen, and he was personally a mentor to me. And that's why we've named this particular award after him. Tammy and Tricia Galloway embody the innovative spirit, having launched not only their own business in downtown Harrison, but by inspiring and encouraging other women in the area to consider bringing their own ideas to life right here in Middle Michigan. Hosting monthly women in entrepreneurship meetups, this dynamic duo is serving as a beacon for those who want to emulate their success and create a prosperous, locally driven economy through the businesses that they launch. So we're very proud to give the Mike Finney Innovation Award to Tam and, Tammy and Tricia Galloway. So I want to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, I'm very proud to consider uh, Brian Kelly a friend. He's a collaborative leader who combines the skills from an accomplished private sector career with an extensive record of public service and reputation for getting things done. He is passionate about making the world work better for all people and uses an inclusive problem-solving approach to make a difference. As president and CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan, Brian is able to put his passion for Michigan small businesses to work. He serves as director of a publicly traded community bank, a trustee of Oakland University. Additionally, he sits on various boards, including Special Olympics Michigan, Sparrow Health System, Disability Rights Michigan, and the Autism Alliance of Michigan. Uh, Brian has the honor of serving as Michigan's 63rd Lieutenant Governor from 2011 to 2018. Prior to that, uh, Brian served two terms in the Michigan House of Representatives. That's where we got to know each other when he served in the House and then after. Two terms as Ionia County Commissioner and worked for over a decade in community banking. He holds a bachelor's degree from Michigan State University, an MBA from Grand Valley State, an MPA from Harvard University. He's an avid runner, having completed more than a dozen full marathons. That's pretty impressive. And he's a very good piano player. He and his wife, Julie, live in Portland with their three children, Colin, Reagan, and Kerrigan. So without further, I want to introduce, bring up Brian Kelly. Here we go. All right, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I, um, first of all, I was delighted to see that you had named a, an award after Mike Finney. Um, Mike Finney was the economic development um, CEO for, uh, was the CEO of MEDC. Oh. Mike Finney was the, uh, was the uh, CEO of the uh, MEDC during the Snyder administration, or much of the Snyder administration, and um, was delighted to see that she had named a, an award after him. Just a really amazing person. I spent some time, he was, um, was CEO of the Miami-Dade County um, Economic Development Corporation uh, at the end of his career and and, um, and even as he passed away a few years ago. And I was down um, just vacationing with my family. It was uh, 2020 in Florida. We used to call Florida the land of the free in 2020. So uh, sometimes if you wanted to, to get out and do something, you'd be there. And we spent some uh, time together. And uh, Mike was just a, an, a, an incredible person. So... Um, for the, uh, when he, some, whoever got the award with his name on it, uh, congratulations, that means a lot. I wanted to share um, some, first of all, I'm gonna start with, uh, with a little bit about the Small Business Association of Michigan so you know what it is and what it's not. So the Small Business Association of Michigan should not be confused with the Small Business Administration of the United States federal government. 
So that's the federal government. Um, the, the association is a 53 year old association, which is, um, which is a vertical trade association, private sector, 53 years old, represents about 50 or uh, 31,000 small businesses across uh, the, the state in every county and in every industry you can think of. And a lot of industries you probably have never thought of. And um, it really is, a, it's unusually large. So the, uh, an association with this many members is unusual in, in, the, uh, in, in the country. The, um, the second largest state-based small business association might have 10, eight or 10,000 members. So 31,000 is pretty big. And it's a testament to what small business means in, in Michigan. I mean, we think about around the world, people think about Michigan, Detroit, um, big multinational corporate headquarters. And we're, we're lucky to have those here. Companies like Dow and Stryker, Ford, Gerber. Um, I mean, these are big multinational corporate names. But to us here in Michigan, those are family names still. And that those those companies actually started as small businesses at one point as well and then turn and then changed the world so it really is in our dna but when we look at what it means to to have an environment conducive for success for small businesses we take a pretty wide view of that so i start wanted to start with this just kind of the philosophy of what it takes to be successful and have a, a pro small business environment we know that place needs business Right, you have to have businesses that are creating opportunity for jobs and careers and wealth generation and income. Every place needs business and the infrastructure of the economy in most of our communities around the state is really made up of small businesses. And small businesses, the economy, needs people. It doesn't work without people. I heard, I think, Jim, you said that Bandit was, had 100 open positions right now. I mean, that you, it's hard to grow if you can't find enough people. We're going to talk a lot about that today, but uh, business needs people. But people need place, right? People, have had, people want to be in communities that work, where they have the proper infrastructure, where these days where it's high-speed internet is a really important component. You know that the average house sale the average home sale for a house that has high-speed internet access, fiber cable access, is 4% higher than those that don't. I mean, just as an example, but people need place where schools work right and, and they have, uh, have opportunity. If any of these things are not working optimally, none of them are working optimally. And so it gives us a wide view on our economy and what it takes to make a... Um, it, an environment that creates the type of landscape that businesses need to grow. Number one issue that we hear is we're just short on people. And I wanna share with you, we're gonna go through several slides and some statistics and some that might actually surprise you a little bit, even if you've thought about, know a lot about this, but the, um, is, I don't want this to be a discouragement, although I will say, that it will never be easier to find people in Michigan in the next 20 years. It will never be easier to find people than it is today. Okay, that's not to say it's easy today. That's to say it is going to get harder. It's kind of built into our numbers right now. Just the demographics, a perfect storm. And, um, and it, it can really be summarized well by this particular graph. Now, the big mountains that you see are when we have more people looking for work than jobs. And if you were to go back 20 years, you would see that there were about 30 job seekers for every 10 job openings in Michigan. So back then we had the opposite problem. We had more people looking for work than we had jobs. Then as you move forward and you see the great financial crisis that uh, in, in the middle there, 2008, 9, 10. And then as you entered into the latter parts of the second decade of the century and then into 
uh, where we're at today, where it gets into red here, there we have literally the opposite problem. Seven job seekers for every 10 job openings. So 20 years ago, 30 job seekers for every 10 job openings. Today, seven for every 10. So if it feels like it's harder to find people, it's because it is in fact harder to find people. Labor force participation. So you'll see that at the peak, labor force participation, and that would be January of, 20, of uh, 2000, January 2000, 68.8%. That was our highest labor force participation rate in Michigan. And there was a precipitous drop that you saw going all the way through to that same, it's kind of the inverse here where you see the big mountain. Here it's the big valley. And it dropped down until about 2011. And then you saw a kind of a gradual climb. By the way, I've heard people say oftentimes that we've been on a steady decline in labor force participation for 20 years. It's actually not true. As you can see, there was a time period when we kind of bucked the trend, even though our demographics were working against us, where labor force participation was actually inching upward. So 2011 to about 2019. Kind of the golden years of Michigan, I think, in the Snyder administration. It might have had something to do with that. I say that kind of in jest. I, but there's a, um, but we actually did have a lot of demand for people pulling people into the workforce. And then obviously it was disrupted substantially by the pandemic. And as you can see, we have, um, we're starting to recover from that, from, uh, from a labor force participation rate. But not back up to pre-pandemic levels. So it is in fact tighter to put some numbers around it. 721,000 people. If we had the same labor force participation as we did 20 years ago, there would be 721,000 more people in the workforce today, people looking for work than we have right now. That's substantial. If you were to just look at January of 2020, before the pandemic, it was 97,000. And so there, there's 100,000 people fewer than just a few years ago. And this is something that is kind of a, uh, a perfect storm. Here's the part that is probably going to surprise you. If I were to say, well, who's missing from the workforce? Most people would say, well, we've had a lot more people retire. And that's true. But in terms of aging cohorts, the only groups of people that participate more in the labor force today as compared to 20 years ago are older people. So we have, yeah, Jim raised his hand. <laughs> he looked less like Santa when I first got to know him. He had dark black hair. And, and I didn't used to get sunburns on the back of my head when we first met either. So it's just one of those things. You know, hey, it, aging is, uh, is the worst option except for every other option. So we have the um, 55 to 64 and over 65. Uh, 55 to 64, about even compared to 20 years ago, labor force participation. Remember, this is the proportion of people in these cohorts working. This doesn't mean just that the, that the pie shrunk. That happened too for some of these cohorts, the pie shrunk. But of the smaller pie, what percentage are in the workforce? So 55 to 64, about the same, a little bit higher than it was 20 years ago. Over age 65 is actually up 4% compared to, to then. By the way, Michigan's, the secret to Michigan's labor force participation and kind of the fact that we're an older than average state, the secret to us being able to function over the years has been that people do tend to work till older ages in Michigan compared to other places. Since the pandemic, it, that has declined some. But not to where it looks like is low compared to the nation, but actually looks more average compared to the nation. So this is the, um, the one bright spot, I'll say, in our labor force participation numbers. If you were to look at what the economists call prime working age, which is 25 to 54. My apologies if you're no longer in your prime. I don't decide these categories, write a letter to economists telling them that they're wrong about it. But, uh, but you see right across the board, 25 to 34, 
35 to 44 and 45 to 54 are down 4%. So labor force participation in that prime working age category is down about 4% compared to, um, compared, compared to 20 years ago. But if there's one thing that should set off blaring alarm bells on this we're short on people problem, it would be this one. Younger workers, age 16 to 19, age 20 to 24, down a whopping 23%. So teenage workers, 23% fewer or less labor force participation. And those in the, in the more traditional college years, down 9.2. Now, the, one of the strongest predictors on whether somebody will robustly participate during these ages is if they start in these ages. So you get a, a, an idea of why I'm concerned about this. Now, I know that there are reasons that go beyond labor, like obstacles to getting into the labor force, why this, these aging cohorts are participating less than they have in the past. Today, work is considered in competition or conflict with education. That's not really how it, I'm 46 years old, it's not how it was when I was growing up. Working was part of your education. You learned how to work when you're a teenager. And that's, now it's looked at as, as you can't really afford to work because you've got to get an education. And then um, sports and, and other extracurricular activities, are a lot more competition these days for work. But this is really a pretty big concern that we don't really know how it's going to play out as, as these individuals who are already a smaller group of people. So we have fewer people graduating from high school, entering college and trade schools and the workforce than before, and a smaller proportion of them are going into the workforce. But it is kind of a perfect storm. So our workforce is aging and retiring. So more people leaving than entering the workforce. Births are not keeping pace. So our birth rate in Michigan, but it's not just here, really in Western civilization, the number of kids that people have are, are uh, declining. And I don't have a proposal for that. I don't have like the solution of what you need to do. I don't even know how to begin to talk to people about that. I have three kids. If I were to explain to you life with my three kids, it would not sound like a commercial to have kids. Like, I don't, I don't even know why we did it. Like, I'm glad, I'm glad we did it. Like, I, I wouldn't trade it. But it's like there was a time when like having kids, it's just what people did. You didn't have to be convinced about it. But now people weigh it. I don't do I want to have kids? Do I, you know, is it worth the sacrifice and all these things? It used to just be a default that it would happen. And, and folks, I don't think that's going to change. Like this is this issue of births not keeping pace with what we've seen in the past. Like that's going to be in our future more than it has um, in the past. And then the uh, negative net migration. So um, we lost about 43,000 people since uh, the last census. Just for kind of to visualize what that means, about the city of Saginaw. That's, a, that's quite a lot of people when you're already short on people. So you put all these things together and you can see that, yeah, it's difficult to find people. But it also informs or it would explain why we spend so much time on issues that 20 years ago a business association would never have con uh, considered to be in their lane. Used to be regulatory issues and taxes, stuff like that, labor law issues maybe. Those are the things that we mainly focused on. We still focus on those things, but this people issue has really risen up to the top. Let me share a statistic with you that will surprise you. Um, you remember that cohort of uh, prime working age down 4%? Because that 4% decline, almost half of it, 44%, is tied to opioid addiction. So why would a business association be, have on our advocacy agenda and the policy work that we do 
treatment courts and substance use disorder treatment options. Why would we be focused on It's because it's a people issue. It's a workforce issue. There are another 700,000 people that are still in the workforce that have substance use disorders. So obviously high risk for falling out of the workforce. Criminal justice reform. There are literally millions of people who have a criminal history, who have just barriers to climbing the economic ladder. Kind of a big month last month, by the way. Expungement, automatic expungement kicked in. 250,000 people went from having a criminal record to having no criminal record. It is our hope that they will more broadly participate in the economy as workers moving forward. And that's something that will, that'll be something that continues on an automatic basis moving forward. Criminal justice reform is something that we're very, very active in because it's a people issue. Can't afford to have so many people sidelined when we have that perfect storm of issues that are keeping people out of the workforce in the first place. Child care. We've probably spent more time on child care policy in the last three years than any other single issue. And it's this idea of, of supply and demand. Like we need more providers and there's a whole set of issues on that side of things. But then uh, individuals that have, especially women, that have barriers to re-entering the workforce, child care is a big uh, part of it. And it's, it actually plays a big role in poverty rate too. The poverty rate two times higher for every additional child that a person has. So again, this whole thing about what's the value proposition of a child, if you think of it that way, it doesn't financially make sense. The, um, and, and so we, we really do focus on child care and then um, disabilities, 40% uh, uh, labor participation rates. Remember, our general population struggles to stay above 60. So we're right at about 60% labor force participation rate right now. And uh, with those with disabilities, it's more like 40%. So there's a lot of people that are sidelined. And these are some examples of areas where there's not some grand slam home run. Do this one thing and then you're going you're gonna, to uh, solve your labor force issue. It's going to take dozens of things done well consistently over a long period of time to make incremental progress. Where we're getting from 60% to 60.2 to 60.5 to 61%. Like to have this inching up of our labor force participation. What it means, hundreds of thousands of more people. We think that upwards of, of 700,000 more people, it's huge economic activity, obviously. It's a cool thing about job openings too, that the more people that are in the workforce, the more jobs that get created. It's just, it keeps, it's the gift that, that keeps on giving. The more jobs that get created, the more people in the workforce, the more jobs that be created, that will be created, that investment follows people. But people need a place. So let's just, I, I know I'm probably, make sure I'm not running out of time here. Um, we did some work with and a lot of other stakeholders on their statewide housing strategic plan. Really thankful for the leadership within MISHTA. And, um, and so this, this is theirs in terms of their, um, the elements of their statewide housing plan. But I wanted to, um, to give a, a few of the statistics first. 48% of renters pay a higher proportion of their total income. And this is when you have a shortage, supply and demand, restricted supply means that prices go up. And we definitely have restricted supply right now. 48% uh, of renters pay a higher proportion of their income to where it's difficult for them to get by. Between 2013 and 2020, the average home sales went up by 84%. 84%. And again, that has a lot to do with restricted supply. It's not like income went up by 84% uh, in the same time period, especially not real and disposable income. And then 40% um, of the housing stock in Michigan is over 50 years old. And our, the number of new build permits in Michigan continues to plummet. The one thing I wanted to highlight uh, in MISHTA's plans right now, because it's a great supply side uh, tool that is being built right now, is, is called the missing middle. 
And it can be really small projects meant to draw in new developers. It could be a single um, residential unit all the way up to hundreds of units. And it's aimed at those that are at the average median income of whatever area that you're in, so say a county. So it would be 60 to 100% of the average median income that if you do housing for that group of people, you can get up to $70,000 in subsidy, subsidy per unit. And in an area like this, that could actually make a, make a deal pretty attractive. And you can use it to revitalize old housing too. So it's not just new, but old, and it could be renting or selling. So if you sell to somebody in that cohort, or you rent to somebody in that cohort, get upwards of $70,000 per unit, which could definitely be the difference between something financially making sense or not and selling it at a price point where a person in that type of an income range, not to be confused with 120% of poverty. That's not what this is. This is 120% of the average median income of the area. Why do we care so much about home ownership? Well, um, we, we consider it a big um, advantage that we are a top 10 state in home ownership. Home, and and that goes back a long time. Michigan has a long heritage in this. Where are most small businesses started? Anybody guess? In the home? That's right. Home ownership is a huge advantage for new business starts. And so we, we want to see Michigan's performance in high home ownership continue in the future because with new business starts, it's a big factor. Uh, connectivity, we talked a little bit about um, infrastructure, in, including high-speed internet and the impact that it has on property values. Um, here's Michigan right here. You see the, you can't read, the, the words are too little, but you'll see the percentages. That's where Michigan is. And you wanna be more toward the top, we're toward the bottom. Um, blue is the is fiber cable access, and then there's other types of access, and then over here, green is no internet access whatsoever. So, 11% um, of our population has no internet access whatsoever, um, and then in terms of the um, high speed internet access, we're a bottom half state, but we have been plugging away. We have been making some progress. Um, year by year in, um, in overall access. Half of people in um, students in, um, of rural students are without high-speed internet access. So this is definitely an area where rural students are at a bigger disadvantage, but even 23% of students in the suburbs are without high-speed internet access. Now, does this matter? Why does this matter? How much does this matter? Well, let's, let's take a look at those with and without access GPAs. A lot of other factors in terms of overall student performance and GPAs, GPA, but this is a really strong um, correlation. I can't promise you that it's causation, but I don't think it's a big leap to suggest that, that these things are connected. And how about college, going off to college? Here we are in a college town. Students going to college, if you have high-speed internet access, you're a lot more likely to go to college than if you don't. So between GPA performance and going to college, these are uh, very compelling arguments for why we need to make a concerted effort to, for high-speed internet. For small business, by the way, too, for it, for it, especially for those professional service businesses where you can kind of be anywhere now, high-speed internet access presents a, um, an exciting opportunity for people. The reason I highlight this is because Michigan's uh, landscape is about to change quite a bit. And that's because we are on the precipice, uh, precipice of getting a 1.6 or maybe closer to $1.7 billion grant that is this, this part of the pie to here, the big part, that's the new part. The other pieces of the pie in previous years was what the whole thing was. And this is aimed at expanding high-speed internet access. So there will be a lot more resources that will come to bear in the, in the coming years to expand uh, overall broadband and high-speed internet access. 
Um, let me uh, close by uh, just talking a little bit about education. The K-12 system is a key, key priority in this discussion. And um, there's a really cool organization called Launch Michigan. Um, I'm on the board of Launch and um, it's a strange bedfellows group. So it's business leaders for Michigan and SPM, but also um, the, the teachers union, the MEA is there with us. Administrators have been um, uh, right along the way working with us on, um, on kind of the in philanthropy and some other um, organizations as well. But it's meant to get past this age old argument of um, people saying, well, we got to have more money to get better performance in our education system. And people say, well, I'd give you, I'd be happy to pay more money for it if only I thought that the ad outcomes would be better. And people say, well, I can't give you better outcomes until you pay more money for it. And we solve the funding uh, gap. And people say, well, I'd be happy to do that. But how do I know it's going to work? It's been there for like 50 years. That argument has gone back and forth for 50 years. And, um, and so what Launch is really trying to do is to get past that, to say, there are performance issues, and we have to have performance measures, standards, and, um, and, and transparency. There are resource issues as well, and we have to recognize that some kids are more expensive to educate than other kids. So if you have a system that assumes that every single kid will cost the same amount to educate, all kids will not reach their uh, potential. It's just, I've, I'm raising a daughter with autism, for example, way more expensive to educate a child with autism compared to a child that uh, does not have a, um, a brain disorder. That is a, um, it's just a fact. Until our system really embraces that fact, we're gonna leave a lot of kids behind. And there has to be accountability, including our governance system in Michigan, which in our constitution is very, very unique and presents a lot of challenges for, uh, for moving forward. But it is really important because we can't, we cannot afford to leave so many behind. 17.7% um, of our uh, residents are now 65 years old or older. So we have to have a high degree of success on a smaller proportion of people that are entering the workforce than we've had in the past. 35th um, in overall um, educational attainment is where Michigan stands today. And, um, it's not like before where 36% of people in 1970 went into manufacturing and didn't require a high degree of educational attainment. Even in manufacturing, it requires a lot more than it used to, but it's still only 13% of the employment base. And here's just where we stand today. And this should not be read as an indictment on the education system. It's just that what is, what is required of the economy is so different than it was in the past. And, uh, and so it has to be renewed. And that's really what the Launch Coalition, if you go to launch.org, I'd, be, and I'd re be really excited for you to take a look at the educational framework negotiated with this strange bedfellows group of people that, um, believe me, there's not very many things that the MEA and SBAM hold hands and walk forward together on. Okay, so this is, this is an unusual thing and it's special and I want you to take a look at it and consider um, the, the role that it might, um, that it might play. So, um, the, the last thing I'll, uh, I'll just point on, there are traditional business issues to watch. I'm just going to highlight one of them. Here's a whole list of them for you. I want to highlight one of them, and that is um, both at the federal and the state level, there are efforts to limit independent contractors, so people that work on 1099s. And, um, and, the, and what the rule says uh, here in Michigan, the proposal in Michigan would be to say that that you may not operate as an independent contractor if you perform a function that is in the usual course of the business of the payer. The usual course, of, that's, that's breathtakingly broad. So in other words, you must only use employees for things that your business usually does. If it's, if it's so I'll give you an example. At SBAM, we have an IT um, vendor, that works on 1099s. We have a fractional CFO that works on 1099s. IT is something we usually do. Financials are something that we usually do. We would no longer be able to use those small businesses to provide us services. We'd have to use employees. Now, if the window broke and we needed somebody to fix the window, well, that's not the usual business that we're in. So we could hire a contractor to fix the broken window. So this proposal, essentially would eliminate independent contractors, which are the seeds of new small businesses. This was tried in California a few years ago. 
Um, this proposal looks just like the one that was tried and failed. There are now over 100 carve outs in the California law because they had so many problems and it put so many small businesses out of business that they didn't want to do that. The, um, but they're still moving forward here. So there are proposed rules at the federal level and there's a, and there's a house bill introduced at the, at the house level. I would say uh, for us, this is our number one priority because small businesses use independent contractors to grow. We don't grow in full-time increments always. And then, um, but also they're the, it's not unusual for somebody to be a professional service provider that's an employee, leaves their place of employment, their previous employer is their first client, and they hang a shingle and start a new small business as a 1099 contractor. And so we are um, really, really keen on this. There's other issues as well that are at risk. We have to pay attention to these because this has to be the type of place where small business can be success, uh, can be successful. And we have to mind the store when it comes to uh, the legal landscape that we're operating in, ensuring that it's uh, conducive to, uh, to small business growth. I really do appreciate your invitation to be here. Thank you for your time and attention, and especially for the, those who are invested in the, in the community, put your talents and treasures to work, to create opportunities for other people. Thank you. Take a take a question or two if anybody has something for me. Yeah. Yes, sir. And your last comment: Who's pushing that nonsense? Well, in that case, it's uh, Representative Hadsma from uh, from um, Battle Creek. And um, the ironic thing is, he actually is a lawyer and has a law firm. And um, I don't think he's I don't think he's uh, connecting the the dots of how many. I mean, just basically, it's um, it's a fight. Here's the thing: it's a fight between big labor and big business. So big labor says businesses when they're negotiating, they say, "Oh, you don't want to make a deal here? We're just going to outsource that work." And it's that's unfair for them to be able to negotiate that way. And so what they're doing is they're saying, "Okay, essentially, you may not outsource anymore." And um, they're casting a net so wide that ironically, it hits small business in a much more um, robust way. And I think it is a, in, in some cases to the, so I don't think it's, it's explicitly like, you know, we wanna squash new small business starts, but that's really what they're, do, what they're proposing. That proposal has been on the docket for three terms in a row, but it had never really gotten legs, but this year it got legs. By the way, the other thing that I found kind of breathtaking about that proposal was that it says that if you're accused of violating the, these, these rules, that it is your responsibility as the accused to prove your innocence. It's very explicit in that. I've never seen a law drafted that way. I've been involved for 16 years now. I've never seen one drafted that way. If you're accused, it is the burden of you to prove that you're doing it right, not for somebody to prove that you're doing it wrong. And the one who accuses you, they increase the fine from $1,000 today, a violation today is $1,000, to $10,000. And the person who makes the accusation gets five of the $10,000. Oh. Oh. Sounds like an attorney. I have, <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of like a contingency thing, yeah. I, had, I have never seen anything like that before. So yeah, this is a, um, it's, a big, it's a big concern. There's a work group that's happening over the summer um, that we'll be involved in to try to um, slam the brakes on, on that proposal. There are other things too, I mean, like predictive scheduling. If you're in hospitality, restaurant, or retail business, um, you, there, the proposal would be that you have to give a, a two weeks notice on what a person's schedule is gonna be. And then if you add or change hours to that, you have to pay double time without, unless you give two weeks notice on a change. And, um, and then if, or if you subtract hours, you needed somebody, but you didn't end up needing them, you have to pay full time uh, for the hours that you didn't need. So um, those sorts of things, as anybody who works in, in those lines know, it's just not, it's not feasible. It, like it couldn't work that way. Um, so we're in, we're in what we would call the education phase, like where we like to have business owners come and explain how their business operates and how these proposals would impact their business. 
All right, one more. How about in the back here? Would increased immigration help the uh, situation with the labor market? I know we talk about illegal immigration, and we've got displaced populations in Europe. If we brought, brought some of those people in, they could make them illegal or bring these people over. Would that help the uh, labor shortage? Yeah, the question is about immigration. Could immigration, I, I would say that in the short term, immigration is the only thing that could save us. The, um, there is a, um, you've seen our population is kind of level, even though we've seen net mount, outbound migration between states. The thing that has kept Michigan level is actually international immigration uh, since, uh, you know, going back, say, um, 15 years or so. And that is, um, if there is one thing, it gets the stuff happening in the southern border is what always muddies up the water. But if we were to set that aside for, for a minute, if I could wave a magic wand and make Congress just like be reasonable, <laughs> the, the, thing that I would, the thing that I would say is that this country by country allocation doesn't make sense. If we say that we're okay with, um, with a certain amount of international immigration, then the fact that we give an allocation to Sweden every year that doesn't get used. So you have a bunch of slots that go empty here and uh, there's a big backlog from India where we get tons of engineers and medical professionals. By the way, our, our medical system could not function without immigration from India. And yet we have a big backlog and we say, okay, we're going to let the ones from Sweden and Denmark go unfilled and we're going to let this, uh, this uh, allocation from India go unused. What I'd say is put, match up the supply and demand here. Like in this case, you're not even talking about an increase in overall allocations annually. You're just saying you're not going to artificially assign them to different countries. You're going to put the demand and the supply together and solve some of our talent shortages. And it's a big win for us. And we can even be picky where we say, yeah, you know what? We need more electrical engineers. Just, just increase the dial and we'll have a bunch more. Like this is one of those areas where it's a shame that the, that the controversy over the Southern border and immigration policy there gets in the way of just rational common sense things that could happen when it comes to our overall immigration strategy around the, around the globe.